Here to discuss geopolitics, the current state of the natural resource space, and buying opportunities for your portfolio is Giant Bandari. Mr. Bandari, it's great to have you back on the show. Uh, thanks uh, very much for having me back, uh, Maurice. <laughs> All right, sir. We have a lot of ground to cover today. I would like to begin our discussion today with geopolitics. On behalf of our subscribers, we appreciate your insights because you travel the world extensively and provide our subscribers with the news before it hits the mainstream news. Aside from Ukraine and Israel, what has your attention at the moment and why? Um, but one interesting thing, Maurice, is that uh, the Western media, the Western economists, the, the Western international organizations have become extremely negative about China. Chinese themselves have become very negative about China. Um, and I am currently in China. I've been here for the last one week. And I don't, I don't uh, seem to get to the same conclusion. I think there are short-term hiccups in China, but China is a very uh, solid country and it will, after a couple of hiccups that it will go through, it will continue to grow and improve. So that is one thing I see about China. Uh, I also see uh, that Latin America is becoming increasingly chaotic. You have um, a, a chaos in Ecuador. Um, you have um, more problems in Colombia. So, uh, you know, and I was talking with a Mexican friend recently and he was telling me that there are areas that he can no longer go to because of uh, the mafia controlling those areas. So uh, the, the third world is becoming extremely chaotic, uh, mostly because America is no longer able to play the job of Pax Americana. Uh, America is becoming increasingly weak in terms of its influence around the world. I definitely want to get to that, but I want to go back to Latin America. I want to go to Argentina. Give us your thoughts on the new president there. Uh, well, uh, I find him extremely impressive. I was very cynical about the whole thing, and I thought that uh, this was he would he would be unable to achieve anything. But he has done well so far, uh, and I'm very, very pleased with that. Uh, I hope he continues to stay in his job, and I hope uh, the people of Argentina continue to side him at least for a while. Uh, you can be reasonably assured that they won't side with him in the long term, because the reason he was elected was not because of his values, and I completely, my values are aligned with his values, and I think he's, he has the right way of thinking. But the reason he was elected to his job was not because of his values, but because from what I understand, uh, Argentinians just got tired of everyone else. So he was the left out candidate, the reason why he won. Uh, and uh, my fear is that the moment Argentinians start feeling comfortable with uh, the status quo, they will start craving for a welfare socialist liberal system again. So uh, that is my fear. That has been the history of Argentina for the last uh, century or so. And uh, it is not unlikely that it will go back to the socialist mode once it has improved a bit institutionally because of the current precedent. When you look at the rest of Latin America, what is the probability that a leader in those countries you just referenced, where they could have a libertarian leader come in? Uh, zero probability, Maurice. Uh, you, I think Chile was um, lucky that it got uh, Pinochet for a while. Uh, Pinochet put it on Chile on track to become a proper capitalist country. Uh, and uh, Pinochet was able to remove the Marxist elements. Now I fully understand that Pinochet was a, probably, uh, you know, pro did a lot of bad things. Uh, but uh, in life, you have to compare what other alternatives you have. And given the alternatives uh, Chile had, uh, Pinochet was clearly a much better option from what I understand. Uh, but those days are gone. I was uh, for a long term in Chile uh, just uh, over a year back. And I was for a long time uh, in Argentina. Um, just over a year back. Uh, Chile looks like a burnt down country because uh, the socialist elements in Chile have surfaced and there is nothing to subdue it. Remember, America is no longer there to stop woke or leftist elements from taking over powers in these countries. So the reason Pinochet was able to take over was because he had the backing of the US. That backing isn't there. In fact, the U.S. is now pro-woke and pro-leftist uh, 
country itself. Uh, so Argentina is the only country which uh, had a hope of becoming uh, a libertarian place. And in fact, if you, you know, if you ignore all the monetary economics number about inflation and about the currency devaluation of Argentina, Argentina and Uruguay have consistently stayed among the best two places in Latin America, even in the past. And in the going forward, they will continue to be better. But apart from Argentina, you should forget that there's any hope at all uh, in any way whatsoever for a person like Millet to come into power because those countries are extremely leftist and extremely woke. Countries that really lack attraction uh, of ideas. Now, on most of these, all these countries are Christian countries. So uh, a Christian person sitting in Europe or North America would expect Latin America con American countries to be more capitalistic because capitalism is more aligned with Christianity. Uh, but that isn't true. Capitalist uh, Christianity is has been adjusted in Latin America to suit the socialist purposes. It has gone uh, what you might call pagan or voodoo in most of Latin America. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, Maurice, apart from Argentina, there's absolutely no hope. And in fact, I'm uh, skeptical even of Argentina staying on course for too long under the current libertarian regime. And I'm a libertarian. I love his Millet's policies, but I seriously doubt he can con continue to make uh, long-term changes in the country. Leaving Latin America, let's go to Europe. There is some protests going on with farmers. What are your thoughts on that? And could that contagion spread throughout the globe? Um, uh, well, uh, you see there are protests happening. Farmers' protests are ha currently happening in India as well. They are the government, the federal government is setting up nails and uh, concrete blocks on the highway to stop farmers from approaching the capital city. So uh, there have been protests by farmers and, you know, protests were actually uh, happening quite a bit before COVID hit us. Uh, and sometimes I think that uh, governments around the world wanted to impose COVID partly because they wanted to stop all these insurrections that were starting to happen and uh, all these uh, anti-climate protests th that were happening, the farmers' protests th that, that were happening. So if you go back to those 2019 and tw early 2020, a lot of protests were happening around the world. Uh, and uh, this, the, the reality is that protests will happen around the world uh, because we have democratic governments and we have made people a large, a very large section of the society very entitled. They think they have the right to the wallets of other people's uh, uh, wallets. Uh, and uh, because of how they think and because they think they have the right to control lives of other people and because they have become hardwired, because uh, Europe and North America have become largely de-Christianized, the moral fabric has gone away. Uh, they have no shame or guilt associated with asking for money from other people as a right. Uh, and unfortunately, that means that protests will actually happen uh, more and more as we move forward uh, into the future. For those of us in the United States that do not travel abroad, what is the consensus about the United States when you travel? Uh, uh, well, everyone wants to be living in the United States. It is uh, always uh, seen as the best country and the wealthiest country, a country that offers you opportunities. And I am fully aligned with that idea. The United States continues to be um, among the very best countries on the planet. It gives the, it gives you liberty, it gives you opportunity, it gives you uh, freedom of expression. It gives you so many liberties that I can't think any other, other country has. Uh, so America holds a huge amount of attraction for uh, a lot of uh, people uh, and they want to move. Uh, and you can see the result of that at the southern border. Uh, literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of people are trying to move into the United States. Now, realize that you and I are both are libertarians. Does the world want Trump or Biden? Uh, well, I certainly want Biden, given that there's no other choice. Um, uh, he is far superior than Biden. Uh, Biden will destroy America in another four years' time if he returns back to power, or any other democratic uh, president who returns to, c comes to power. 
in the U.S. will destroy the U.S. Uh, you know, Biden has brought in millions of new illegal Im migrants into the United States. And in my view, it doesn't really matter whether they are, whether they are legal or illegal. You're destroying a society by bringing in cultures that are completely alien to the American idea. Um, so uh, Biden will destroy the U.S. Uh, and I hope Trump returns to power. And my, my thinking is that Trump will likely return to power, but even if he returns to power, a large so section of the society will refuse to accept him as the president. Uh, and unfortunately, the problem is that uh, a vast chunk of the society had, has been hardwired into expecting its entitlements as a fundamental right, as if it's a firmament of uh, as if it's a part of the universal firmament. Um, and that is not going to work well for the United States in the medium or long term. Now, I think you initially said Biden, but I think you meant Trump. Am I correct on that, that you would vote for Trump? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry if I, uh, if I said things wrong. Uh, I really hope Trump wins the elections because that's our only hope. And despite that, uh, I think there will be conflicts in the country because the leftist and the welfare uh, expecting people uh, will not want to accept Trump as their president. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you're enjoying today's show, we ask that you please give us a thumbs up and leave a comment below the video. Switching gears, let's discuss some natural, the natural resource base, I should say. Giant, I think we all enjoy a sale, but we all enjoy a profit even more. Now, throughout your investment career, have you ever experienced such a disconnect between the metal prices and the corresponding ultra low equity prices? Um, well, yes and no worries. Uh, I have uh, always been very critical about, uh, let's say, 80 to 90 percent of companies in the junior mining sector. They have they are um, they they aren't really there to create value. They are there to. Uh, fill the pockets of the CEOs and other people in the management. Uh, those companies have been uh, a big problem for the sector. They have used up capital and they have it, they have confused the investing uh, public. Um, but there are, uh, let's say, 5 or 10% of the companies which are good companies run by good managements. And because they have fallen with the bad companies, these good companies are extremely cheap. Uh, and I think that is those are the companies that you're talking about. And from the perspective of those companies, there's indeed a huge disconnect between uh, what they have and the market capitalizations of those companies. Uh, they should go up uh, 100, 200, 300 percent. But you have to focus, you have to be very selective. You have to look at only those 5 or 10% of the companies in the sector. Now, which precious metal has your attention at the moment and why? Um, gold uh, certainly continues to be uh, a very well-priced uh, precious metal in my view. In fact, it's the only com uh, metal that I can consider to be precious metal. Um, gold hasn't done what, what it should have done. Uh, you know, the... The, uh, the the real interest rate will continue to be negative. Uh, and uh, uh, even, you know, once they start adjusting the interest rate, nominal interest rate in, in a month or so, uh, gold will pick up uh, and gold has to pick up because uh, that is one of the, it has qualities that uh, virtually nothing else has. And uh, because people will be looking at it uh, at one point of time when the chaos really becomes felt and visible by these people, uh, then gold price, I think, will start to perform very well. Now, you referenced gold, but not silver. Just curious, what is it about silver that you don't like? Uh, well, it's not that I don't like silver. It's, uh, it's, it's the fact that silver has um, a lot of industrial usages um, and um, the, the trying to understand where the pricing of silver stands because of the industrial usages is hard for me. It's just my lack of competence in that area. Um, uh, remember, I mean, if silver price goes up, uh, some of the pro industrial products that it goes into might become uh, products that uh, get substitute that substitute silver for something else. So, because I don't understand the dynamics very well, uh, I abstain from looking at silver as uh, uh, as a precious metal uh, and uh, that's why i prefer not to speculate on it but at the same time silver has historically been used as uh, as a precious metal and if gold price goes goes up 
silver has a tendency to go up because people start substituting silver as a precious metal in place of gold. What will be the catalyst to get capital to flow back into the space? Um, I, I think what I, uh, we, I'm not very sure of this, uh, Maurice, to be honest, but I think once the nominalist rate, interest rates by the U.S. Is start uh, Fed is start getting cut, it should immediately start reflecting into increase in price of gold and a very, very significant increase in price of some of the junior mining companies. Now, as an advisor to institutional investors, where are you advising your clients to speculate and why? Uh, um, uh, we, we look at uh, companies across the commodity spectrum. Uh, we look at copper, gold, uh, coal. Uh, I have followed uh, a lot of coal companies and we have done extremely well with those coal companies. We talked about it, Maurice, and uh, maybe you and I talked about it about a year back. Most of gold, those gold stocks have given us 20-25% uh, return over the last one year. And I think they will continue to give us a similar return going, uh, going forward. So coal companies, are, you know, we look at the whole sector which uh, where we can uh, really understand the valuation of those companies and projects. We don't invest in companies and projects based on what is in the names of those companies or what the management um, might might um, want us to think about, imagine they have. Uh, we want to have some concrete evidence on what they might have and then we want to see whether what we see as the value of those companies matches uh, is is much higher than the market capitalization of those companies. And that's what we look for. Yeah, one of those coal companies that you referenced in our interview back in May, if I'm not mistaken, was Peabody Energy. Are you still uh, excited about that proposition? Uh, well, uh, so I haven't looked at Peabody Energy recently. I think I at eventually I sold it because uh, some of the Aussie companies uh, the, it started attracting my eyes a lot more than American uh, 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 coal companies. And one of the reasons is that one of my uh, institutional client is not based in the U.S. and the U.S. imposes a massive amount of tax on dividend payments uh, that come from American companies. So uh, we decided to uh, not follow it that closely, uh, but the Australian uh, coal companies uh, are continue to be the ones that we like. Now, you rain that doesn't mean it says anything negative about uh, Peabody Energy. I think it's a uh, the valuations are great, and uh, um, I, I probably should look at it again very soon. And uh, in the next conversation, I will update you on it. Well, thank you, sir. Looking forward to that. Now, uranium is on everyone's watch list. Do you like the investment proposition? Um, well, uh, Maurice, I never chase uh, any commodity. Uh, and I think uranium, in my view, is overpriced uh, for the simple reason that the long-term prices are, the, the contract prices are lower, much lower than the spot prices. Uh, and uh, a lot of ETFs have uh, taken away uh, uranium as a commodity from the market, which has... Uh, which has very likely added to uh, a short-term speculation in uranium as a commodity, which has led to a massive increase in uh, share prices of uranium companies. So I'm very afraid of uh, uranium uh, companies and uranium uh, these days, um, uh, um, um, it, despite the fact that usually I, I, us I don't speculate in commodities. That said, I'm actually, ironically, very well placed in uranium. And if you want, we could talk about it. Certainly, sir. If you have any names that you want to share with our audience members, they'll be more. So, me. so yeah. So this is uh, one company that I don't um, don't uh, understand very well, but they have uh, they are doing uh, they are merging in a three company merger that is currently happening. It's an Australian based company called Ninety Two Energy. Um, they have a big um, uh, uranium project. They have several uranium projects in Canada, and the and the three party merger uh, is going to happen in such a way that this Australian company, Ninety Two Energy, will cease to exist uh, in Australia. It will be trading only in Canada. That's what I understand so far. Which means that there's a lot of fear among the Australian shareholders because they think erroneously, I must say that their shares will get, uh, you know, untradeable after the merger is over. So they have been selling and I have and I have played this arbitrage game in the past, particularly when it comes to two, ju ju 
to two jurisdictions in which one jurisdiction one jurisdiction will no longer be the exchange where the company will be trading at. Uh, that means that 92 Energy, based on what it is going to be appointed at, is trading at a 35% arbitrage difference. So you can make about 30 to 35% arbitrage money waiting for the merger to happen, which should happen sometime next month. Uh, particularly if you are positioned or if you understand that you will be able to sell your Canadian shares once the merger is op over. So look at uh, 92 Energy, it's trading at uh, about 51 cents. Uh, and uh, the, this will be among the uh, one of the larger uranium exploration projects. Um, and uh, the merged entity will have raised, I think, about 20, 25 million Canadian dollars uh, over the last one or two months. So it is based on that financing price that I'm telling you that you have a 30% arbitrage upside, plus any benefit you might get from a uranium uh, hysteria, what I would say, uh, Com coming into play in this uh, merger. Yeah, Giant, I'm, I'm smiling as you're saying this because I'm remembering a conversation you and I had, I believe it was 2016. And what's ironic about that conversation is that I interviewed you the while the Super Bowl was being conducted, and I'm doing that right now. And I believe it was, is it Sunridge Gold that we, that you met? Correct. Sunridge. So ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> listen to this man, because eight years ago, you shared with us Sunridge Gold was going through the same, a, a similar situation. They were actually delisting, and that was in February. Then May 19th hits, and we had a six over a 600% return on our investment. So listen to Mr. Bhandari. <laughs> well, and Maurice, uh, the, a very interesting thing was, and I'm sure, I don't know if you remember that, I was driving from New York to Philadelphia, and the warrants of uh, Sunridge were, for whatever reason, is still... Sorry, the the Sunbridge was a still is still trading on the OTC market uh, yes. at one point of time, and I was driving, and you called me up and said, "What is happening with the, these shares?" Uh, and I pulled over and I looked at the numbers, and uh, we made actually a lot more money in those OTC shares because those were trading as if the cash had already been paid. So within a week's time, uh, I guess we made uh, five or 10 times our money on the new money invested in those OTC listed uh, uh, shares. Uh, so yeah, th there's a lot of market discrepancy that can creep up uh, and uh, that is uh, almost certainly the case with 92 Energy. Now, again, I must say, Maurice, that I don't know the management. I don't really, uh, I, I don't know any of them. Uh, but from whatever I have seen, I feel reasonably sure that at 50 cents Australian, I'm well supported uh, in terms of uh, making uh, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps 30 percent, but at least not making a loss on what I will have invested at. And again, I just want to go back to Sunrise Gold here. A similar, again, another correlation here. It, we didn't expect this return. What we, you shared with us, I recall now, the stock was at 28 cents, and they were going to delist at 34 cents. And then, then May 19th happened, and it dropped down to a penny. I recall that now. <laughs> yeah. So the markets do not function rationally, and as you just shared, uh, the ignorant, uh, particularly in illiquid markets, particularly yes. in illiquid markets like uh, junior mining sector. Yes. So you have this situation now with the Australian shareholders; they could be overreacting, and you could have another situation as we experienced there with Sunridge Gold. By chance, now thank you for sharing that uh, arbitrage opportunity. Are there any more opportunities and or stocks that you'd like to share with us, sir? Uh, well, we can talk about uh, a couple of companies. One is uh, Aztec Minerals. Uh, I am uh, quite a big shareholder of that company. Um, I quite like the management. I like both the properties they have. Uh, and uh, they are, a, the, the Simon, who is the CEO, is a go-getter. He, he raises money. He goes goes in right away to start drilling the projects. So I quite like that company. I think it's a worth looking at. Given everything is, uh, uh, you know, uh, under strain these days, I would get, give a stink bits for a company like this. Uh, I think O3 Mining is, uh, is still uh, uh, well-priced. It's trading at not very, um, it's actually trading lower than what they de recently did financing at. Um, uh, I participated in that, that financing. Uh, Irving Resources in Japan just did a joint venture, or sorry, they, they agreed on a joint venture with Newmont and Sumitomo. They will formally get into it in about a month's time. Uh, that is very interesting. Irving Resources has a project in Japan uh, uh, 
But it can go down to zero, of course, because it's an exploration company, very early stage exploration companies. But they have a very, very exciting project, a Magano project in Kokushima area uh, in the southern part of Japan. I, I've been there uh, several times to Japan looking at projects of urban resources. You know, last time we spoke, you covered Gold 79 Mines. Uh, any update on that one, sir? Uh, well, um, you know, again, it's a company I like quite a, quite a bit. I, I like the CEO of the company. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the the project they have in uh, the, the project they have is uh, is very exciting. It's hardly trading at anything. I think the company's market cap is at two cent. It's trading at uh, a couple of million do- dollars with a management that is actually very well established in raising money when it has to. So I think it it should do very well at two cents. I can't see myself making a loss. I actually own a a, a, a large chunk of. Uh, Gold 79. And full disclosure, I'm a shareholder in Gold 79 Mines, is a sponsor of Proven Improbable, and they are located in the Walker Lane. Three projects there. Uh, Take a look at their website, Gold 79 Mines. Now, sir, before we close, all of the aforementioned are connected in one way or another to a subject that's your life's passion, and that is philosophy. For someone new to your work, how does philosophy apply to our discussion today? Um, uh, well, it, Maurice, it helps me understand the world um, better. It ha- gives me a crispier understanding of what should happen, what might happen with the world as time passes. Uh, and uh, that helps underpin my understanding that uh, West uh, is actually on a path to decay because they have institutionally continued to arm themselves uh, largely through uh, 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 immigration of people who don't fit in well uh, by the fact that the third world countries, because of they are no longer run by colonizers, their, their institutions have continued to decay very rapidly. And because Pax Americana is going away, uh, third world countries will deteriorate and fall apart across the board. Latin America, Africa, Indian subcontinent, they will just dissolve into tribal units and uh, have a horrible future. Uh, As I said, Maurice, I'm currently in China for about two weeks, uh, partly to celebrate uh, the Chinese New Year with some friends, but also look at some investment opportunities. There are huge economic problems here. Not the problems that I see with my eyes, but... Health problems that I understand from talking with the people here. Uh, you know, buildings and apartments here are completely empty, uh, and they will always remem- remain empty. Um, so China has a crisis, uh, has a few humps to go through, uh, but I think China will emerge uh, well from that. So I'm cont- I continue to be very optimistic about the future of East Asia because. They are doing a lot of things right that others aren't. Now, speaking of philosophy, Mr. Bhandari, you're the founder of the philosophical seminar, Capitalism and Morality, which focuses on reason, argumentation, and liberty. For someone new to capitalism and morality, please introduce the seminar and some of this year's speakers. Um, So the next seminar will be on the 1st of January when this year in the downtown campus of Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and I have run this seminar for the last four, 14 years. Uh, uh, I enjoy it, uh, Maurice. I bring in people to talk about issues that other people, other uh, organizations don't talk about because they might be politically very incorrect. Um, I think it's uh, free speech is extremely important. Bringing in Western philosophy is extremely important because there's something very, very unique about uh, the Western society that com- continues to be very unique. Uh, you know, I was talking with a couple of Chinese friends yesterday uh, who have uh, taken on reading the Bible on a regular basis and uh, going to the church. And, uh, you know, the people talking about the concept of truth, uh, the concept of truth is so alien to uh, people who are who did not grow up in the Western ecology. Um, and even the people who grew up uh, as uh, immigrants or people who not believing in uh, certain mainstream uh, values of uh, the Western society don't really fully understand it. That truth is uh, such a key aspect of the Western um, philosophy. People in the West, Americans, Germans, English, are so focused on the search for truth and they are unhinged to any tribal idea when it comes to searching for the truth. Whereas most of the rest of the world is hinged to their tribal ideas, their religion, their 
nationalism or whatever. Um, so uh, I want to uh, bring people to my seminar and talk about truth and discovery, uh, talk about the greatness of Western civilization, the classical Western civilization. Well, as a Christian, I'm elated to hear that those uh, individuals are going to church. Amen. <laughs> All right. Now, the registration is not up yet. Is that correct for, for the seminar? But I do also want to make sure that that's, if I can correct one thing. Yeah, that is. You, John, if I may, I think you stated the 1st of January, and I think you meant the 1st of, is it the 1st of June? Oh, God. I, it, it, it is the 1st of June, uh, Maurice, indeed. Sorry, my apologies. My mind is probably not working very well today. <laughs> no. Yes, it's on the 1st of June. And regarding yeah, and the, and the registration and registration is not yet open, but uh, I will open it uh, within the next uh, uh, three weeks. And ladies and gentlemen, we encourage you to visit Mr. Bandari's website. Take a look at the past uh, seminars. You will be delighted. You're in for an intellectual treat. I assure you, I put my name on it. Giant, give us the website, please. Um, it's giantbhandari.com and there's a tab called Capitalism and Morality. You can watch all the past videos for free on the website. And there's also a registration page for, the, for this year's seminar there. Last question, sir. What did I forget to ask. Well, again, uh, Maurice, uh, you know, my seminar will be very interesting. I have uh, Dr. Ricardo Duchesne speaking at my seminar as a keynote speaker. He's coming for the first time. I have become a big fan of his. Uh, you, you might want to look at his uh, Twitter page. Um, and um, so again, uh, it, it will be an exciting year. Uh, and I, you know, Rick Rule, Walter Block, Jeff Teist, as usual, will, will be at the seminar. Mr. Bhandari, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Wishing you the absolute best, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, Maurice. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.